they're little things and parts of service um, that happen without people really knowing it because the township has always been a valuable part of helping the city develop. The township trustee has some very important things to play uh, that need to be continued. Whether or not the county can get this done uh, has not yet been proven, as far as I know. And the closest government to the citizen is clearly city and township government when it's all said and done. Since 1853, the Board of Trustees has led Clay Township in Hamilton County, Indiana, towards a prosperous future. The history of the office of the trustee goes back to the early days of township government. When the county was formed in 1823, there were too few people to be bothered with too much government. But as the population grew, they needed to divide the land up so that they had better control. And Thomas Jefferson, being a surveyor himself, was interested in the challenge of dividing this land in the new Northwest Territory. When I was about your age, that was when I first became interested in surveying. And because of my early interest, I've done so many things in my lifetime that have related to surveying. Jefferson, who wanted to settle the Far West, that was one of the big, big things he was interested in, along with the other founding fathers, realized that that system wasn't really going to work. You needed to figure out how to divide it up, particularly when you got into land sales, and you needed some sort of easy to monitor setup that could just be decided, surveyed, and away you went. So, and so that's how I came up with the idea, of kind of the, the township system with the range lines and the township lines, and then divided into 36 sections of one mile each. Initially, it was White River and Delaware. Delaware and Clay actually came together at, at Rings Line or west of Boulevard today as we know it. Then the town of Bethlehem, later known as we know Carmel, was all at Maine and Rings Line. So you had three governmental entities right there, and they all had to work together as time moved along. Eventually, about in the 1830s, 1833 or thereabouts, they actually started dividing up those two larger townships into the smaller townships, into White River and Jackson and Adams, and then um, Wayne Township, uh, Noblesville Township, and uh, Washington Township, and then uh, Fall Creek and uh, Delaware and Clay. Townships helped establish a form of rudimentary government. Prior to the establishment of towns, towns of course would be platted by an individual, somebody like William Connor or something like that, um, there was a need to kind of keep some sort of government entity, a way to collect taxes, a way to organize for the schools. People could go ahead and pay their taxes by doing road work, um, and they could report to the township trustee for doing that. Uh, they could pay their taxes that would then go to the township schools. My great-grandfather, whose name was Daniel Ragsdale Christian, was on the first Clay Township Board. And that board was formed by uh, an act of the county commissioners in 1853. They had two orders of business on their first meeting. One was schools, and the second one was roads. A few years later, the state created the office of the trustee. In 1859, the state legislature passed an act that established the trustee. The trustee had not been established when the first board was in 1853 and the first trustee was elected in 1860 here. And it was Jonathan Wilson who had been the president of the first township board. And the elections were held at that time on an annual basis in the spring. 
The reason they did that, they needed an administrator. The board members were there, they're basically the legislative body. As, as time went by and the population began to grow, they had to have somebody that could answer to the people, and that's why they used the trustee. The township trustee is empowered to do many things, and a lot of these things date back to the time when it was a very agrarian society. You have things like fence disputes, dog tax. Dog tax was established for roving dogs that would kill farmers' animals, that he could be reimbursed for the loss if he had a sheep or a pig killed by a dog. If you owned a dog, you had to go and pay for a permit to have that dog. And it was every year. You'd go to the, the township assessor, you'd pay them, and then they would turn around and give the money to the township trustee. And then if a farm animal was killed by a dog, then the, the township trustee could pay that farmer back for that animal. The dog tax was repealed in July of 2006. Township trustees, um, the sorts of things they did uh, were essentially, like I say, collect taxes. Um, they also uh, would work with the overseer of the poor, which was actually at that point in time a separate uh, entity. Throughout the latter half of the 1800s, Clay Township continued to grow and develop. In 1874, the town of Bethlehem changed its name to Carmel. In 1882, the Monon Railroad came through bringing more people, goods, and businesses to the region. The Monon came through Carmel from Indianapolis, and it went clear to Chicago. You could follow the Monon tracks through small towns all through the state of Indiana. When you have a way to transport goods and people through a community, that's going to make a mecca in that community. Around the turn of the century, a major natural gas boom in Clay Township grew the population even more. Still, well into the 20th century, Clay Township was largely rural, composed of small insular farming communities. I was born in 1923 and uh, I've lived here 84 years. When I was first born, this was a gravel road, and very few cars went up and down this road. Carmel itself was uh, probably about 400 people at that time, and later on I remember when it got to 680 people. Now you have to add a couple zeros to that. It was just a small town with uh, farms all around it. When I came out here in the 50s, and I'd say most of the 50s, we had a rural telephone. And to get central, you had to crank a, a bell on a wall. And Phil Carell was an attorney that lived out here. And I called him one time, and Martha Bell Farron answered the central. And she said, is that you, Leroy? And I said, yes. And she said, are you trying to get Phil? And she, I said, yes. And she said, well, he just went down. I think he's at Maudie's Meat Market. I'll ring down there. And she rang down there, and he was there. The Vampire and the Ballerina. Growing up in Carmel, uh, there wasn't a lot to do. We had the, the Carmel Theater. Who stalks the countryside in search of victims for his insatiable bloodlust. The Vampire and the Ballerina. We'd go to the show maybe once a month, and Grandpa and Grandma would take us to the Dairy Queen about every other Sunday evening, and we'd get an ice cream cone. Back then, you know, it was a, a nickel or 10 cent, 15 quarter. There were no changes in Main Street, no new buildings, 
no new fronts on buildings, but as you walk down either side of the street on Main Street Carmel, you were looking back 50 years at least. Toward the end of the 50s, the Eller Bridge over the White River on 116th Street met a fiery end. Back in October of 1957, the, the bridge was set afire. It took about 15 minutes for the thing to go completely into the river. Uh, they believe that somebody, of course, had a, a flammable ball that they spread on it and, and, and torched it. It was just such a valuable uh, uh, part of our transportation system. Once that bridge went down, there was a lot of problems created for kids getting to school, for people commuting to work. By the end of the 1960s, however, Clay Township and Carmel, specifically, began to experience dynamic growth. When I was the town attorney, it exploded. Out here, just unbelievable how it grew. Uh, Keystone came in and uh, 465 was entered, and that gave the access to this ground. I remember things like Keystone stopped at 86th Street. Um, I remember uh, riding on Keystone in the, in the 60s. Uh, when it was uh, non-stop like it is today, but no roundabouts, it was just a straight road. They added Keystone north of 86th Street, and then of course took it all the way up to where it, it picks up on US 31 North. And that really opened up uh, the community for its citizens. Instead of coming down range line, that was about the only road you could use to get into Carmel, that really opened up the east side of Clay Township. The township board, meanwhile, continued to provide services traditionally associated with the trustee. The township trustee did a lot of things, but the basic things he did do was in providing fire protection uh, where it didn't exist. Number two, in providing poor relief to those that uh, were less fortunate. And the third was in, in, in providing the care of cemeteries. In the 70s, there was significant money available to township trustees for fire protection that were not available to municipalities. Townships received federal revenue sharing. That was very helpful in the fire service because when Sam Purcell was township trustee and also when John Hensel was trustee, they used that money to help with the purchase of, of equipment and buildings for the fire department. Well, John Hensel built Station 45. Um, he uh, put together the money and, and purchased it, the whole entire building that included the, the fire station, the trustee's office, the waste district, and the assessor's office. So this time, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. James Dillon to come up. Jim uh, Dillon is uh, on the township board. When I became chief in 1996 uh, under Mayor Brainerd, um, the township had always helped in, in with stations and, and equipment. With liberty and justice for all. One of the most fun experiences I had as trustee was when the uh, new apparatus was ordered for the brand new fire station, which made it the sixth fire station and I went with the guys to Pennsylvania and got to ride back in the big engine and we came through all night and every place we pulled into when we needed gas they wanted the, us to set off the uh, siren on the engine. Everybody was admiring the engine. You were up as high as the semi trucks and people would wave and honk and everything else. They would have run the siren when they delivered me home uh, except it was it. 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning, we didn't want to wake up the neighborhood. Many places in the state, throughout the Middle West particularly, you had pieces of ground that were set aside by churches or by schools or by individuals as a cemetery. 
The Whitechapel Cemetery is reminiscent of early settlers, primarily because of the names on the stones you see here. These are the first families who came in, uh, generally from the south. They came in shortly after 1818, when this central part of Indiana was opened to settlement by a, a Treaty of St. Mary's with the Delaware Indians and others. Uh, they came here to farm. At least by 1835, there were enough of them here to begin a Methodist congregation. Uh, they had a log church, perhaps. Um, the current church that's on the grounds here was begun in 1850, finished in 1853, and it's been an active uh, Methodist church and now a community church. What you see here is typical of a small graveyard in, in the Midwest, or all across the country for that matter, not only in the uh, style and the shape and the ages of the stones, but in this case in particular, uh, we see some very nice uh, restoration that's gone on here. A uh, program by the township trustee is now engaging in restoring gravestones in all those cemeteries that the township trustee is responsible for. To me, you know, it's, it's, it's history worth saving. You get in these old yards, you know, and, and it's the heritage of each community. Actually, they become like outdoor museums. And so, you know, not only are you just saving, not only saving the, the memorial of someone that's done completed their life, you're saving the artist's work that carved the stone. You're saving the information. There are four that uh, are in Clay Township that the trustee has responsibility for, although there are a couple of additional ones that are on private land. As township trustee, I take care of pioneer cemeteries, and that's cemeteries before 1939. They can be abandoned. It could be that a church uh, could not take care of the, the cemetery or an individual could not take care of a cemetery. See, when people came, ac came across this, this country, they, they buried people where they died. So they could have had, you could have a family plot right in the middle of a field. A good example of this is the cemetery that is down in Home Place. Uh, there's a, 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 a veteran of, this, of the War of 1812 buried down there. That's how long that, that cemetery's been there. And somebody had to take care of that. Well, it became the, the responsibility of the township trustee. One of the things that we've added this the past year is a website. It's pioneercemeteries.net. And you can go there, you can bring up the, the headstone and read the headstone. We show it before we repaired it and what it looks like now. Well, cemeteries are extremely important uh, when you're doing genealogy. They give you a lot of information that you might not have anywhere else. I have um, several ancestors that are buried here. Originally, I knew that my mother's parents and grandparents were buried here. And the farther I got into it, um, the more relatives and ancestors I found in here and it just got real intriguing and I became very involved in the cemetery itself. What I tell my genealogy students about cemeteries is that they are a priceless source of information, early information, because there's not much of a paper trail until the late 1800s. But there's a lot of historical information on the to early tombstones in the cemeteries, and they definitely place your ancestors in a given place at that time. And I sat there and I thought, wow, I never even thought about this. And so I made a decision that I was going to go ahead and start taking better care of the cemeteries and, uh, and, and fixing them up. Boy Scouts are fan fantastic. They're wonderful. They come in to help Sorry, cut back weeds, uh, uh, set up stones, level them, uh, do all kinds of things of that nature. And it saves us lots of money. They get their Eagle badge and then, and then we get that, that, uh, that good service that they provide. Well, this cemetery is very important to me because I live right down the street from it. I have to drive by it every day. And once the restoration was done, it just it, it brought a, a beautiful centerpiece to this corner and to our neighborhood. One of the trustees' most important jobs has been helping the poor, and one of the trustees most involved in helping the poor was John Hensel, who became trustee in the late 1970s. Well, my dad became trustee uh, 
poor relief was, was, was minor. I mean, we're talking uh, 5, 10, 15, maybe 20, 20 cases a year. Um, when he left, it was, it was over 100. Uh, it, you know, in 20 years, it grown immensely. And the one thing I can remember about my dad, you know, uh, he didn't mind helping people, but they had to show proof that they were going to help themselves. He just wasn't going to give it to you, but you had to show proof that you were going to help yourself. The, the only story I can really remember about people standing out was uh, a gentleman in, in the in the early 80s, he came in and asked for help, and my dad said, well, have you applied for a job? And he said, yeah, they offered me a job, and they're going to pay me uh, $10 an hour. And my dad goes, did you take it? He goes, no, if I didn't get paid $15 an hour, I wasn't going to take the job. And my dad says, well, you were offered a job, you had a chance to take care of yourself, I'm not going to help you. And that guy left really upset. I don't know if he got, to, got a job or what happened, but... Uh, uh, he pretty much was not going to help the guy because he wasn't going to help himself. Nevertheless, Hensel and his wife, Rosemary, were generous when it came to helping the hungry. Rosemary had her little uh, pantry, and you could go out there if you were in poor relief, and you could stock up your, your, your pantry from their pantry. Uh, yeah, they handed out cheese and, and uh, uh, sugar and spice and everything nice, but... But uh, they were, they, that was some, some kind of a couple, and uh, I loved them. They really were great. Okay. <laughs> in August 1991, the township entered into an agreement with the city of Carmel to form a park department. The John and Rosemary were also invited. famous for their annual bean dinners. They'd invite uh, dignitaries, you know, uh, uh, from the county, from people from the state. Uh, local people and they'd have a bean supper and my mom would fix the beans for them and stuff and I was always invited to come and attend but I refused to go because uh, when I was growing up if we had ham on Sunday we always had beans somewhere during the week. The bean dinners were an annual event with rosemary, uh, uh, bean soup and cornbread and, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, fellowship and it was around the big table there in the kitchen of the house, the old house, and it was one of those things that uh, uh, just was a ball uh, to, to, to be a part of, and, and uh, you'd, you'd, you'd walk out of there feeling a lot better than you did when you got there. They were, uh, they were fun things to be a part of, but those two were, were they were very unique. And, and, and I guess if you, had a, if you had two people that represented the township trustee as far as the knowledge of the community, you couldn't find any two that had any more depth than those, those two people did, as far as this community is concerned. When John Hensel passed away while still in office, his wife Rosemary took over and served out the remainder of his term. In 1997, John Hensel was honored when his name was chosen to adorn the John Hensel Government Center. Besides fire protection, cemetery upkeep, and poverty relief, the township board has also been involved in developing new parks and trails, such as the Monon Trail. The park board was formed in 1991 as a joint cooperative effort of Clay Township and the city of Carmel. And at that time, there were two parks managed by Hamilton County, although the property was owned by the city. One park was what we call Gray Road, some people will know as Carmelot. That's at the corner of 106th and Gray Road. The first capital investment in parks was made at that park by John Hensel with the county option income tax revenue that he received at the township that year. We had formed a, a parks department and American Aggregates donated the ground for the Flowing Well Park, which is a good story, really, because the CEO of the company was an Australian, and he came to Carmel to see what they had, had purchased. And we had a little luncheon, and I'm talking to him, and he says, now we want to be good corporate partners, and if there's anything that we can do 
to, you know, to help, then, then please let us know. And out of my mouth came, well, you could donate the, all of the area around the flowing well so that we could put in a, a, a park down there. It would be a great nature area and it's really not anything that's developable because it's low. The following day, Mike Harmon from American Ag called me and said, Ian said there was something that you requested and he said, make sure she gets it. And I said, oh, that leaves the door wide open for me, doesn't it? But I was nice and said, no, it's, it's a, the, the area around the Flowing Well Park. That's why the park is there. It's because American Ag donated that, that ground to us. I had no idea that the Monon would end up being what it is today. I'm not a biker, but it just seemed like it made a lot of sense to develop the Monon Trail. I got section maps that showed the whole Monon in Clay Township, and we would haul those to Carmel Fest every year and put up a display and start talking to people about um, the potential for the Monon Trail because we had this abandoned rail corridor going right through the middle of our community. So we wanted to maximize um, use of the trail and invite and encourage folks to bicycle or walk or rollerblade, jog, whatever, to the new facilities at the park and not have to drive. When we first started, we knew we needed to develop other park property. Central Park uh, was identified early as a possibility and once that property was obtained, we then decided that we would have to pay for that property before we could develop Central Park. This was basically, uh, for the most part, a large cornfield that was probably a good third underwater most of the year. And um, a wooded portion runs up toward 116th Street. The, the shape of the park is like a boat with a giant sail. It is not a, a regular shape, it is an irregular shape um, as pieces have been put together, but that's part of the charm of it. And the plan for the park was to be um, a real green space, oasis uh, in what was a growing urbanizing city and to serve the needs of the community here in the central core of the city. The park's board was also intent on including a skate park at Central Park. One of the things we really wanted to include was a skate park for these kids. I mean, some of these kids are incredible athletes. Basically, I got a stack of skateboard magazines from uh, the skate shop up, up on, off a of range line and said, let's just start going through the magazines then. And you circle or cut out the, the pages of the things that you guys think would be really cool. I like to see some nice rails, ramps, half pipes, boxes, just the essentials. I like half pipes, rails, ledges, and stairs, and curbs. And then we did a community survey at each uh, junior high school with um, pictures of the various elements that this little group had picked out and then had all these kids vote on what they thought were the most popular features. Then that went into the design of our skate park. It's the thrill. You're going 15 miles per hour on a board where all that separates you are some metal trucks and your wheels from the ground. Just to like be able to use your legs to create new tricks. It's just, it's basically my life. I love it. One of the things that excites me the most about this project is the unique nature of the opportunity that all of us have. You wonderful citizens who are leading the way locally and all of the planners and engineers and architects, lawyers and construction experts that you have brought together to put this magnificent 160-acre project together all at once. All right, one, two, three, pull gently.
Clay Township is unlike other Indiana townships. When the town of Carmel became the city of Carmel in 1976, the unincorporated area of Clay Township was 43 square miles. By 1990, it was 37. Today, it is 1.5 square miles, quite a decrease. Meanwhile, the incorporated area, the city of Carmel, has grown from 7.4 square miles in 1976 to 49 square miles today as a result of annexation. Well, things have really changed. I mean, that whole area where, where we now have the beautiful Palladium, I mean, that whole area was so different. And watching what has happened as these buildings have gone up has certainly changed the dynamics of the township. And I really think it's been for the better. James Lee raised the right hand and repeat after the guy, James Brainerd. Hi, James Brainerd. As I mentioned, uh, this project was designed... Much of the growth in the incorporated area is due to the vision and dynamic leadership of Carmel's four-term mayor, Jim Brainerd. So we have a new resident as well. As the unincorporated square miles in Clay Township have decreased, they have been claimed by the city. The face of the township has now changed. The haunts of yesterday are now bustling with the activities in the arts and design district. Main Street has changed from the one Leroy found in the 50s. The movie theater is long gone, but now there is much more to do. Instead of a couple of parks, the city overflows with parks, with features for everyone. The city has a transportation network with environmentally conscious roundabouts that bring visitors to study them and offer citizens quicker, more relaxed driving. And Keystone is now a parkway, no longer a gravel road. All right, I will, uh, let's see, we, heard, we had a request for summertime, isn't it romantic, and back home in Indiana. So those songs have never been performed together in a medley until now, so. <laughs> Summertime and the living is easy. Fish are jumping. Citizens enjoy a high quality of life, and the often not aware of the community's humble beginnings. Oh, your daddy's rich. So while the unincorporated area of Clay Township has decreased, citizens enjoy tremendous benefits offered by the city of Carmel. So hush, little baby, don't you cry. Summertime. 